Thank you all for joining us today for the MSU Folio Speaker Series on Spirituality, inaugural lecture on spirituality and social justice. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi peoples. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized in Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who are forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indi uh, indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Additionally, I would like to thank today's co-sponsors, the Center for Integrative Studies in the Arts and Humanities, Citizen Scholars, the College of Arts and Letters, the Department of African American and African Studies, the Department of Religious Studies, the MSU Alumni Office, the, uh, the Muslim Studies Program, the Office for Institutional Diversity and Inclusion, and Peace and Justice Studies. Initiated in honor of Father Jake Folio, an alumnus, former faculty member, longtime priest, and mentor to countless MSU student athletes and coaches, the MSU Folio Speaker Series on Spirituality offers the opportunity to explore the manifold meanings and applications of spirituality in the contemporary world through lectures, talks, workshops, and experiential events. The series aims to cultivate greater awareness of and appreciation for the many ways spirituality manifests across global religious cultures, interacts with public life, and emerges as a secular orientation for pursuing meaning, purpose, and belongingness. In addition to a fall faculty lecture, a spring faculty talk and experience, which will begin next year, various co-sponsored events, and an annual spring keynote, each year also includes specific events and talks dedicated to highlighting the connection between spirituality, social justice, and diversity, equity, and inclusivity. As Jim Wallace contends, quote, the connection the world's waiting for is to connect the hunger for spirituality with passion for social change. Because spirituality, when it isn't disciplined by social justice in an affluent society, becomes narcissistic. Throughout his work, teaching and life, Father Jake embodied the same idea, consistently emphasizing the need to understand spirituality in relation to our base humanness by extending beyond strictly religious conversations to see spirituality in a worldly light as the ways in which humans seek out not only self-awareness and self-assurance, but cultivate compassionate and empathetic concern for others. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stressed in his strength of love, quote, only through an inner spiritual transformation do we gain the strength to fight vigorously the evils of the world in a humble and loving spirit? The MSU Folio Speaker Series on Spirituality seeks to unpack how spirituality leads to and complicates this commitment to act humanly and justly while attending to its religious, secular, and worldly applications. It offers space to consider how spirituality advances individual meaning and collective worldviews, all while attending to global flows of people, cultural knowledge, and religious traditions. Central to these conversations is to understand the ways in which spiritual teachings, orientations, and obligations advance commitments to social justice and connect to projects of social change. To this end, I am honored to introduce today's speaker for our inaugural lecture on spirituality and social justice, Dr. Anthea Butler. Anthea Butler is the Gerald, uh, Geraldine R. Siegel Professor in American Social Thought and Chair of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. A historian of African-American and American religion, Professor Butler's research and writing spans African-American religion and history, race, politics, evangelicalism, gender and sexuality, media, and popular culture. You can find more of her writing and public engagement at AntheaButler.com. Butler's recent work, uh, a recent book published by UNC Press is White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Professor Butler is also, uh, also is a contributor to the 1619 A New Beginning with a chapter entitled Church. Her first book is Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World, also published by UNC Press. Professor Butler uh, grant awards include a loose ACLS fellowship for the Religion, Journalism, and International Affairs grant for 2018-2019 academic, uh, uh, for 2018-2019 academic year to investigate prosperity gospel and politics in the American and Nigerian context. She was a presidential fellow at Yale Divinity School for the 2019-2020 academic year. She is currently a co-director of the Henry Luce Foundation funded Crossroads Project for Black religious histories, communities, and cultures. Professor Butler currently serves as president of the American Society for Church History. 
a sought after commentator. Professor Butler is an op-ed editor from MSNBC. Her articles have also been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, NBC, and The Guardian. She has also served as a consultant to PBS series, including Billy Graham, The Black Church, God in America, and Amy Semple uh, McPherson. A Q&A session for which I will act as moderator will follow, the round, uh, will follow today's talk. Please feel free to use the Zoom Q&A feature to post questions during or after Professor Butler's talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anthea Butler. Oh, you're muted still. You know, you would think after two years, I would know how to do this, right? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Morgan, for the gracious introduction. And thank you so much for having me be the inaugural speaker for your series. I think um, for lots of reasons, I know why you picked me, but at the same time, I think that it has caused me to have some real thoughts about the intersection of spirituality and social justice. And so I wanna start off today by, I'm gonna share my screen with you just really quickly and talk about what this might mean in the context where we find ourselves today. Um, the title that I gave for this talk is Repression, Regression and Resolve, Spirituality in Repressive Times. I think I would be remiss not to talk about where we are right now, because I think it has a lot to do <clears throat> with the ways in which people respond to social justice and what you have to do if you're someone who's involved in social justice, who has the desire and the will to be involved in issues that are all around us today that involve, whether we're talking about racism, we're talking about um, LGBTQ issues, we're talking about issues of war, we're talking about issues of inequality. All of these things require something of us, both intellectually, physically at times, morally all of the time, and very much spiritually, because when you do this work and how you do this work has a lot to do with how you approach it. And so I thought with this beginning slide, I would talk about what happened with the last year and what has happened with Asian Americans and then they take a little step back and look at, um, look at things in a perspective. One of the things I think has been really important about what has happened, whether we think about the shootings in Atlanta, the kinds of um, horrible events that we've seen with Asian American, and especially Asian American women and men being beaten in the streets of San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and other places here in my hometown of Philadelphia, this is happening as well, is that this is happening to a community that for a large part has been quiet. And I wouldn't say silent, I will just say quiet in part because there has been an expectation by the public. That expectation is this, oh, they are model minorities. They're not doing anything. They're happy to be here. They're hardworking and nothing happens. And so to have these kinds of events of violence and, and racism and specific kinds of hate focus in on the Asian American community has been very troubling to watch. But it's not that we don't know what these things are we actually do know what they are. And they're a pattern in our country. And they're a pattern of violence and racism and exclusion. And so when this happened to the Asian American community, for a lot of people, that, that was a moment in which they had to step back and look at themselves. Where am, I, where am I in this community if I'm a part of this community? Why is it that even though I've done so much that there has been so little that has been in regard to me, to protect me, to guide me, to be within this community? And so I think what we're required to think about in terms of spirituality is not just so much about how we go out and do social justice. It's what that does to us when we are in the midst of these kinds of painful experiences because of our race, our creed, our nationality, our sexuality, any of these things. And I think today what is important about my talk is to hear this intersection between spirituality and social justice as an intersection of how to take care of self, of how to face the mortality that we all have. And so while I think in the first part of this, you'll be a little bit surprised because I'm gonna focus in on things that are uncomfortable and that is violence. I want to focus in on that because there is a core issue about spirituality that all of us have to face within thinking about social justice, and that is death. What happens? What is the end? And how does that happen? And so I want to start off by showing you a picture that was an iconic picture 
from the Ferguson riots that happened or uprising as you might want to call them over Mike Brown's death in August of 2014. This picture appeared on the front pages of the St. Louis uh, newspaper and all around the country. It was from a young man who basically had thrown back, who was wearing this American flag shirt and who threw back a tear cast canister at the police. He's dead now. And his death has been under suspicious circumstances. I wanna read a piece from um, back in 2019, Ferguson, Missouri. Two young men were found dead inside of torch cars. Three others died in apparent suicides. Another collapsed on a bus. His death ruled an overdose. The six deaths, all involving men with connections to protest in Ferguson, Missouri, drew attention on social media and speculation in the activist community that something sinister was at play. Police say there's no evidence that the deaths have everything to do with protests stemming from a white police officer's fatal shooting of 18 year old Michael Brown and that the two homicides were in no link to, with no known link to the protest. Now I bring this up in part because what we tend to think about in terms of protest and social justice is that most of the time this is about a death that has happened. In this particular case, it was Mike Brown's death which happened in August of 2014. That time was a, a big turning point in terms of how people think about social justice and what was then the nascent Black Lives Matter movement. It became an important part of how people thought about social justice. But the one thing I think that for many people that was surprising is that religion got relegated in some sense to the background and the ways in which we normally think about spirituality and social justice. We have a problem in America. Part of the problem in America is that we've been conditioned to think about social justice and spirituality in the midst of social justice in certain kinds of ways. And the reason why that is, is because of the civil rights movement. We are inured to think about this as being nonviolent. We also think about this as being long suffering where you have people who have prayed for a long time for something to change. You have the long suffering of people on marches, the beatings that happen, the non-responsiveness to those be beatings and the supposed endurance and persever perseverance that people are apt to have and not saying that they should, but are apt to have or hope to have in the midst of all this violence and pain. And so what has happened in these kinds of particular instances in social justice movements before Black Lives Matter and Ferguson and subsequent has happened is kind of a role playing situation. The role play is you have bad white actors, you know, inflicting violence. You have black people and others who may be in solidarity with them um, receiving that violence and are supposed to be willing acceptances of that violence. But Ferguson changed all of that. And this picture really exemplifies it because here we have a young man who is like, look, I'm not taking this you know, tear gas canister and just accepting this, I'm going to throw it back at you. My sense of self, my locus is I am going to fight back. And so that is a different kind of spirituality. That is a different kind of way to think about social justice. That is a different kind of way that assists itself. It puts itself in this kind of certain spot. That means that social justice doesn't have to be just receiving violence. But how did we get here? How did this kind of thing happen? And what has this play been all about in the midst of thinking about the relationship between social justice, violence, and spirituality? One way to think about this, of course, has been with the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And to see briefly, this picture that you see of him uh, looking at a bullet hole is from Florida in a house that he stayed in in 1964 outside of Miami when he was there working on a couple of marches. And I used that rather than the picture of Birmingham because I wanted to show that he has some, had to face this throughout his career. If we go back and you've had a civil rights class or anything, one of the big moments, the important moments of King's life is when he gets a call and when he's doing the Montgomery bus boycott and somebody calls and says, we're gonna kill you and word, blah, blah. 
and there's a bombing at his home. And he has what most people call the kitchen table experience, where he has to think about, am I going to go forward and do this? And he feels a calm that comes over him and that God speaks to him. And this is the moment that many of his biographers and others who write about him claim that this was a sense in which he came to grips with his mortality. And subsequently, he has to live with somebody stabbing him, the kinds of uh, events and arrest and other things that happen around his career. But it's not simply just to him. It's also to people around him. The other pe per person you'll see here is a picture of Fred Shuttleworth's house, which got bombed in Birmingham on Christmas Day of 1956. Now, why are the two th pictures important? They both show violence. Fred Shuttlesworth had declared after the end of the Montgomery bus boycott that he would be integrating buses in, Mont in, in Birmingham the, the day after Christmas and had announced this and everything. And while at home with his family and two church members, his house was bombed by the KKK. Now, this is on Christmas Day. Obviously, the KKK does not care about holidays and they bomb his house. No one dies, but this it basically destroys his home, which is next to the church. Now, you have to wonder why would somebody continue on to do these kinds of things, to do the social kind of justice marches and fights for civil rights? The one thing I always say, especially in my students when I teach this, is that most of you don't think about what it is like to give up your body. There is an existential thing that has to happen for you to understand that you may die in the process of doing justice. And I think that's an important point because most of us don't see ourselves going out that way. We see ourselves thinking about the violence that has been perpetrated and how we want to affect justice in our world. But we don't think that we will actually pay the most, the biggest price we could pay for that social justice. And I think this is one sense in which something that we can learn from the civil rights movement is that the presence of death also puts forward a different kind of way of A, being in the world, and B, a different kind of way you have to look at your spirituality when at any moment your life may be expired. You may feel as though this is the end. And that is an important part of what happens with social justice. Social justice does not come without cost. And for these men and for women, as I'm gonna show you in a minute, there's these kinds of costs that happen within social justice that cause us to have to think about the ways in which we do this today. Fannie Lou Hamer is another figure um, from Mississippi who endured great trauma and great suffering in the midst of doing social justice. You know her from the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party. This is a picture of her and I'm gonna play this very short clip of her when she says she is going to run for a congressional seat. And this is a phrase you've heard all the time. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. I think one of the important moments about Fannie Lou Hamer is its statement of we are sick and tired of being sick and tired encapsulates something about what happens when you are fighting for social justice and you are exactly holding the burdens of that. Fannie Lou Hamer dies not just with lots of health problems because of the beating that she received in the Mississippi jail because she tried to vote, but she also died having very heavy depression, a depression that came over her because she was not at the time even able to pay for her medication at the time of her death. And so the toll in which social justice does take on people is something that we haven't looked at. Fannie Lou Hamer's life was very difficult as a sharecropper. And then when she decided to get involved with uh, registering people to vote and trying to vote herself, and then also the kinds of struggles she faced as an African-American woman in the midst of what was A, a patriarchal society, B, a very racist society, and C, a civil rights movement that saw women as ancillary to male pastors and other figures that were within this movement. Still, she was able to rise up above all of that and be the premier speaker of the Democratic National Convention in 1964. One of the things I think is most important about her as a spiritual person and her spirituality 
is the way that she unflinchingly looks at the parts of her life that have been difficult, the abuse, the beatings, the ways in which she was treated different, difficultly, the way that she reframes her Christianity in such a way as to take on some of this and understand it not just in this way of persecution, but in a way that brings her to a kind of resolution about the things that she has to do and how she sees it. And so Hamer puts us in a framework to think about what does it mean? And so we could talk about different people within the civil rights movement who all have kind of a way in which we think about that spirituality. Their spirituality is either being, they make a resolution and it brings them closer to God. It's a resolution that ends up saying, I'm gonna go deeper into this movement, no matter what the pain is, or you could think in terms of what the Black Panther movement and the Black Power movement said, is that we are tired of being in this particular space in which we have to always acquiesce to certain kinds of behaviors and norms, and we are going to take this forward and do something different with it. And we're going to look at this in a way that we are going to fight these kinds of things and have a spirituality that is not a spirituality that stays stagnant, but a spirituality that stays moving. Instead of that, for instance, what I would say is that you have people who decide that I'm not going to be standing praying, I'm not going to sing songs, I'm not going to do any of that stuff, but instead I'm going to be engaged in the community like the Black Panthers do, and I'm not saying they're all spiritual, but some of them are. We're going to get involved with Catholic churches in Chicago, we'll get involved with churches in Oakland, we're going to provide things for children, and we're going to do justice in, in that way, and, and very importantly, we are not going to be nonviolent. We are going to protect ourselves. We are going to use guns and everything else. Now, you might be saying, what are you saying, Professor Butler? Are you saying that people should be violent? No. What I am saying, though, is the amount of violence that gets perpetrated upon people in the midst of trying to fight for justice also correlates to the amount of what people are going to be enabled to take. In other words, it may be that you get to a point just like many Black Panthers did and some people in the Black Power Movement did who moved away from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and moved away from the, I would say, more moderate forms and Student Nonviolent Coordinating Commission to think about ways in which arming oneself was a way to achieve a peace because you are protected. And so I think we need to think about that in terms of thinking about how there are different kinds of spirituality and social justice, even within a civil rights movement that we see as a monolith in terms of nonviolence, in terms of how people think about that. Now, let me shift gears for a minute and talk about Ferguson. We are Let's go. All right. Now, before I show this, one of the things I want to say about Ferguson is this, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about my own personal story at the end of this. When the when the killing of Mike Brown happened in August of 2014, that was a big moment. And I think that what is different about where we are today, especially with Black Lives Matter, is a couple of things. One, in the civil rights movement, one of the things that was important for people to do and for the, um, for the organizers like King and others to realize was that they needed to have eyes on this so that everyone would see the kinds of violence and hatred that was being perpetrated in the South through racial means, whether that was by police, hoses, dogs, all of that kind of stuff. So the television became important. The shift I would see now about social justice is what is important to those of us who are in social justice movements in any kind of way possible right now is the way that the internet is used and how social media is used. I can think back about how I was in London, England at the time that Mike Brown was killed and watching my Twitter timeline completely blow up with all the pictures of Mike Brown's body laying out in the streets of St. and the streets of Ferguson, the, the gathering together, how the police came together and, and all of this became a conflagration of, of stress, of, of crying, of hatred even, and of a way in which the normal usual suspects didn't work. And the usual suspects had to think about different things. And so one of those usual suspects, and I don't think of her as being usual at all, is Pastor Rita Lampkin, who uh, worked in Ferguson with different groups. And I wanna play a part of this video and I'm gonna talk about what she says. I won't play the whole thing, but I want you to get a sense 
of her experience in Ferguson, being a, a white female and being a pastor in the city. If hate compels the fight, the fight is lost before it is begun. Reverend Renita Lampkin says she's in the middle of one of the biggest fights of a believer's life. When she's not here praying for her congregation, she can often be found here on the streets of Ferguson, marching against police brutality and the killing of Michael Brown and waiting for the grand jury decision. I've heard the predictions, been pulled into secret meetings, um, I've received anonymous messages. Um, if all of that prediction holds true, it's going to be very scary. Where will she be? Like Where she always is, standing in between police and protesters when tensions explode. <laughs> Turned there on August 13th when tear gas flew and military vehicles rolled in. I just was praying, you know, that's it, just interceding, um, you know, asking God to, to build a line, to draw a line that couldn't be crossed on either way. She said that night she left with bruises, hit with a police projectile. But she keeps going back and has been criticized for it, accused of inciting protesters. That's her wearing a scarf to cover her face. Really, all I'm doing out there is praying. I'm very aware of the presence of evil and how, um, as I'm seeing this as spiritual warfare. She says the war she and others are waging is against the policing system in America. There is a nation of exhausted people and we are exhausted with this policing system having carte blanche opportunity to gun our children down without accountability. Those I want to stop it right there. One of the things I think is really interesting about her comments is to let me start at the end with this idea about exhaustion. Folks, this was 2014. I cannot even tell you how exhausted people are right now in 2022 with the litany of, of murders that we've had with policing and in this country. And so that's number one. Two, I think what's really important about this is that she has a certain kind of way in which she is inserting her spirituality into this kind of social justice work that she does. She is seeing this as spiritual warfare and, and prayer is the thing that to get there. And she's trying not to put herself um, in, a, in a certain kind of a spot with the groups. In other words, you know, she can see this as being evil, but on the other hand, she's on the side of the protesters, the kinds of abuse that she's received because of that. And I know the kind of death threats that she got because she and I had a conversation about this a few years back. Now, what does all this mean? I think in Ferguson, Ferguson is this moment where you see two things. You see a pastor like Reverend Lampkin, who is thinking about how can I be out here for the community? And yet what happened with a lot of the other protesters was that when Jesse Jackson came to town and others, they were like, get out of here. We don't need you. And this was a moment, I think, for a kind of coalescing of something that we didn't really quite expect. And what we didn't expect about social justice was that there was a way in which you could take this kind of thing outside of the regular sorts of uh, ways in which people think about justice in terms of churches and all of this, and to put it in a different kind of space, to put it in a space in which people could exercise different kinds of spirituality, whether they were thinking about African traditional religions, whether they were atheists or agnostic, and to say there are things that we think that are important within this that we can glom onto. And what Black Lives Matter did with this whole idea about Black Lives Matter and how this came out uh, with Opal Tometi and others, is that it gave people a humanistic space in which to exercise a certain kind of spirituality that was focused in on not just the ways in which you can do this through a religious group, but that you could do this through a movement that represented something, that represented a way in which we want to live differently as human beings. We want something better to happen. And what we don't talk about, what we don't see, what we don't focus in on in a certain kind of way, is also the toll in which it takes on people when they are within these movements. And so I want to show you a chart here real quick to talk about the psychic and physical toll of social justice. Um, this is a chart 
that was uh, made not right after George Floyd here in 2020. This is the anxiety and depression spike for Black and Asian Americans after the police killing of George Floyd. You can see how for Black people this went up 41%, for Asians it went up to 34% between May 28th to June 2nd. I can tell you that um, personally for me, this was a very, very difficult time. It was a time in which we were in the midst of COVID, first of all, uh, the Breonna Taylor case had been spoken about. There was another case in Rochester, New York that had happened of a mentally ill African-American man being killed by the police. And then we had George Floyd. And so all of these things, plus the lockdown that we were experiencing during this time period about COVID, was a very depressing time. It was anxious. You didn't know what was going to happen next. I experienced this months later and again when we had a mentally ill man killed here in Philadelphia. So all of these things begin to make for a kind of a toll that takes on people who are involved in social justice, but not just involved for leadership, but regular everyday people who are having to intake this all of the time. And so the way I wanna sort of shift our conversation here at the end is to talk about what it actually means to be spiritual in the kind of time that we are living in right now where the killings are relentless. I just saw another clip today about how much that police killings have not stopped since George Floyd and continue to rise. I believe we're at somewhere, I think last year it was 200 and something and now we're on track to meet that or surpass that in 2022. These become important moments. And this is not just about talking about people who are at the forefront of social justice movements or Reverend Barber or somebody like that. This is to talk about the everyday quotidian ideas about people who care about social justice, who are involved in certain kinds of ways, but are also feeling the brunt and the pain of this. How do you survive it? How do you think about this? And here's what I have to talk about myself. And I'll leave this here at the end. One of the things that I have to really admit, and, and one of the things that I thought a lot about, whether I would talk about or not on this um, talk today, is what kind of toll it's taken on me to do this work. And I think for me, this is a very reflective moment in part because I didn't come to this in a way that I would say um, was something that I desired to do, A, or B, something that I thought that would make my career better. Neither one of those things were true. It was out of a gut reaction to certain kinds of things. And the first time that I think that I was involved in social justice was a piece that I wrote back in 2005 about Hurricane Katrina and the ways in which the media had told, had um, used a couple of pictures that were going out on the AP wire and some other wires about white people who had found some bread in a store and were waiting through a flood, but another picture of an African-American man in New Orleans who had gone in the store to get some supplies because there was nothing around, obviously, after the hurricane came through, he was looting. And so those differences to me were about racial disparities, but they were also about a way in which African-Americans were always seen in this country as not just simply trying to live and survive a major hurricane, but, you know, oh, wow, he's looting in the midst of this when, you know, there's no stores open and half of the city and the Ninth Ward is flooded and overrun its bank by a broken dam. Now, the levy, excuse me. One of the things that happened then was that it put me in a, in a space to start to think about the kinds of things I wrote publicly because I wasn't writing publicly before that. I had done a few things publicly, but not very much. What it made me do was to start to see these inequities that were around me. And so what I had to decide to do when I started writing about things like Mike Brown and others is where did my rage go? And um, those of you who may know me for a very long time, I knew I wrote for Religion Dispatches, I wrote some very you know, pointed kinds of articles and pointed kinds of titles that got me death threats and I even had to move my home because of this. But it also took a toll on me personally, spiritually. I did not think that um, you know, God was around me. I didn't think that I could do this journey. I didn't think that my colleagues knew how hard it was on me to go through all of this. And yet I was always being asked to talk about these things. And so one of the things that I had to do was look to the tradition of my birth, which was Catholicism, to try to get a way in which to front for all of this. And so while some of the things I'm gonna talk about here at the end are not necessarily Catholic, they are ways in which I think 
are useful and helpful to think about how do you frame spirituality, whether you are a religious person or not, in terms of thinking about social justice. And so for me, I am somebody who was um, very impressed and has been very, um, I would say, foundationally oriented towards the Jesuit tradition. And St. Ignatius of Loyola, who is the founder of the Jesuit order, uh, in his spiritual exercises, talks about the ideas of consolation and desolation. And so consolation is when you are in your right mind, that's first of all, and you are feeling good about yourself and you know that where you are spiritually is in a solid place. And that doesn't happen very often sometimes in this very tum tumultuous world, but knowing when you are in consolation are the times that you can be strong about doing social justice work and the kinds of work that takes a lot out of you. Where I found myself after a lot of these murders and especially after George Floyd was desolation. Desolation and in the spiritual exercises, what Ignatius says about desolation is that you shouldn't make any decisions in desolation. And I found that to be very true. I never had understood that before um, this la that particular big event in part because there were so many things that I could have said that were really harsh that were the kinds of, you know, the police, you know, you know, all cops are bad or whatever everybody else was saying during this time period, right? But I needed to not say anything, but to sit with the fact that this thing had happened. And I think that for many of us who do social justice work, it is very difficult to sit with the thing because the thing hurts. And the thing also makes you realize, as I had to say to my students before too, is that I could be waiting at the bus and get shot and killed either by somebody driving by or get into an altercation with the police and they decide that you know somebody discharges a gun or does something stupid, I could die too. And so having to face that in the midst of trying to do social justice, I think is an important part of spirituality. If you haven't guessed it by now, this talk is really kind of about death. And it's about preparing for something, but also living for something. Living for the idea that we must know that at the end, there is only the things that we have done and what will remain that matters, okay? But in the midst of that, we have to also think about how do we find joy? I've been really moved by a friend and colleague of mine, Ashon Crawley, who talks a lot about finding joy, who in the midst of all of this, and I've known him for a while, started painting and has become very famous for his paintings and for his literary writing, as well as his work in religious studies and African-American religion. And I think one of the things that he's taught me is that you have to have a practice of joy within the midst of these tumultuous times, in the midst of times where you see yourself not having any hope because the world is evil around you. And you can think about Ukraine right now and all of these other things that are happening, not just there, but around the world, Yemen, all these other spots. How do you find joy? How do you maintain joy so that when you do this work of social justice, that you have something to draw in on? And I think that is really important. It's something that I've had to really learn and, and really struggle, I have to be honest with, because there's a lot of times that I don't feel joy in the midst of this work. There's also the way in which you have to learn how to step away. This has been something that I have been talking a lot to people about who are both within and without the movements about how do you step away. And because we can be so connected to everything, whether that's Twitter or Facebook or the television set or in our reading, we have to have times in which we step away from all of the information that we get about you know, social justice or the lack thereof of social justice. Um, one of those days for me was 1-6 when the Capitol was taken over. It was very difficult to watch all of that. And then I had to be on top of this doing a work of justice in a way to talk about what had happened. But I also knew that it was a moment in which I needed to step away from all of that violence because to see all that violence, which was very racialized and, and very hate-filled, that there's the only way that you can achieve that calmness the meditative activity that you need to do to settle your mind in order to focus. And I think it's really very important. People can ask me questions about this, about maintaining a kind of practice of, of meditative, you know, thinking about things, 
doing rituals that help you to get through to drown out the noise and to also focus and center yourself in such a way that you know you can help to manage some not all of the depression that may come over you because of it i think also you have to be pay attention to the transience and permanent and permanence of life um all the last three of these i think go together suffering and death as ever present. And I wanna talk about them all together as I close up and I'm looking at time. One of the things I think that's very, very crucial here is to realize that we are finite beings. We live our lives every day and especially now in this pandemic where we continue to keep the same amount of pace that we keep all the time. And in part, what social justice work, in, at least in the American context, requires you to do is to be on guard and focused all of the time. And so because of that, you don't really get to see the long game of what your life can or can't be. And I think it's really very important for those of us who are going to do this spiritual justice, this social justice work, and to consider our spirituality, is to realize that there is one day that you are not going to be able to do the things that other people can do in the movement. One of the things I had to really understand for, for myself personally was that I can't go march, you know, and be out there for hours and hours anymore. I have physical issues that allow me not to do that. And, and it's very difficult. But what else can I do? Can I assist people who are out there? Can I do something else that'll help? you know, support those who can be out there by, you know, financial means or other means. Can I support them with my writing? What can I do? And so you have to find that space in which you know what you can do in the midst of um, social justice and to keep your sanity at the same time. The second thing I think is to think about what, what is death in the midst of this? And for many of us, we've had to think about death as the deaths of innocent people deaths of people who didn't deserve to die, like Mike, you know, Mike Brown, or over Swisher Sweets, or um, George Floyd over a supposed counterfeit $20 bill, and to be knelt on for nine minutes and have his breath expired out of him. Those are the kinds of ways that we think about impermanence in terms of the movement, but we don't think about the impermanence of ourselves. The impermanence that means that we have to decide at some point that if we get involved in this, that we too may end up not alive anymore. And I think from me personally, and for us corporately, that is the moment of greatest tying in to what holds you spiritually. How do you see yourself after death? Do we have an after death? Is there anything after death? Is there nothing? And, you know, I've been thinking about this in terms of the Buddhist kind of way of, you know, everything is nothingness, or how do we even think about it that our consciousness may go on, however that is for you. I think it's really important to grapple with the idea of death if you're going to grapple with social justice at all. Because in the context of where we are, not just in this country and in the world, social justice means that you may end up dead. And you may end up not being able to continue that work. And you might not see the end. And I think that's really true. So I'm going to close with something that King says and that I think we don't think about as much. You know his mountaintop speech before he's assassinated the next day in Memphis, Tennessee. Always drives me crazy because I worked on the Church of God in Christ. And usually people say that this was the Masonic temple that he spoke in, but it was really Mason Temple. And as we come up to the anniversary of his assassination here early next week, I think one of the important things to think about is that that mountaintop speech is not so much about, I'm not gonna get there with you, but it's also about, I understand that I am not going to be the end of this thing, that even if I end, I am not the end. And I think I hold on to that as a way in which to think about my personal spirituality in the midst of trying to do social justice work. I may not be here to see all of it, but like King, I am not the end. I am not the person who is going to finish this off. It doesn't rely on me, but I have to think about myself as this being that is not just within this movement, but with within thousands and millions of other people who have these same kinds of desires, but we're all gonna end up in the same state of death and impermanence. And what matters is what we leave for those who will remain. 
It's not about making a name for ourselves. It's not about doing all this other stuff, but it's like, how do we leave this space a better place? And how do we maintain our spiritual selves in the midst of doing this very difficult work of social justice in an imperfect and an unjust world? Thank you.